Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, as Aileen has said, I'm going to be drawing together some insights from our work on framing food, framing poverty and health, all with the intention of actually building support for all the solutions that we've been talking about today that need to happen. First, just a little bit about Frameworks UK. Um, we are a not-for-profit and essentially what we're doing every day is trying to work out how could we talk about this better? How could we have a better conversation that are going to lead to the changes that we'd all like to see? And we do that by partnering with other mission-driven organisations to really, first of all, understand how people think about different social issues, not just what they think, but actually why they think it in the first place. And then we use that knowledge to develop and test different ways that we could frame a range of issues so that we can really help organisations to create the lasting change they want to see. Here are some of those organisations that we've worked with recently. You can probably guess from this collection of logos some of the issues we work on, children and families, homes, poverty and health. And I want to draw attention in particular to HSE on there. We've done some work with HSE in Ireland recently, um, advising on how best to talk about the issue of um, children's health and obesity as well. Now, this slide is a bit cheeky. I don't really expect you to read it all. It's, it's definitely total overkill, but it's just to really illustrate that there's a substantial body of research that I'm drawing from today, and it's available to all of you. If you just go on the Frameworks UK website, search by issue, you can find all of this. Now, I'm going to be particularly drawing on our work on reframing children's health and food, um, which we've been doing with our partner, Impact on Urban Health. Uh, our work on talking about poverty, uh, which we have been working on with Joseph Roundtree Foundation for a number of years now. And also our work on the wider determinants of health that we've been doing more recently with the Health Foundation. And by bringing these together, I'm hoping I can just share some insights, some recommendations that I think will be useful in your work, and particularly on that sort of outcome from Elena's report. How do we actually now talk about this in a shared way that's going to be most helpful for building support for the changes we need to see? A very simple agenda I've got. So first of all, what is framing? Why does it matter? Um, I've always had a, already had a, we've had a fantastic introduction to framing from, from Elena. Um, got some more examples so we can really build on that even more. Then how do people actually think about this? What have we seen coming out of our research on, on food, poverty and health? And then those recommendations that I would encourage you to think about for shifting hearts and minds. Now this is how we define framing at frameworks. It's, it's very much it aligns with what Elena was saying earlier. Basically framing is the choices that we make about what ideas we share and how we share them. So that includes choices like uh, what we emphasise, how we might choose to explain an issue, and what we leave unsaid. Now, all of this matters because these choices can lead to really radical changes in how people think, how people feel, how people act. Now, the other thing about framing is that we're all doing it all the time. There's no such thing as unframed information. But when we make these decisions deliberately, and I would say ideally backed up by evidence, we can just make them with a degree more confidence that our communications are really landing as we intend them to, that we're being heard as we want to be heard. I'm going to start by sharing just a couple of quick examples to illustrate some of that impact that we can see from framing. So first of all, in this classic experiment, the researchers wanted to look at the impact of framing on the choice between different medical treatments. So the respondents were asked to basically choose between surgery or radiotherapy treatment for lung cancer. Now, some of the respondents in this uh, piece of research were patients, some of them were medics, some of them were students. So a range of, of knowledge and expertise within that sample. Now, one group were told that first statement that there's a 90% chance of survival following surgery, and the second group were told there's a 10% chance of mortality following surgery. Now, similarly to our fantastic stain remover example before, you might notice that that's the same. It's the same probability, but it's been framed differently in terms of survival or mortality. Now, despite the fact that that number is essentially saying the same thing, there were some significant differences in the results. The survival frame led to a, a substantially higher preference for surgery amongst the respondents. But what's really surprising here, what's perhaps most unexpected about this study, is that this framing effect 
was no less pronounced for the medics who were involved in the study. So even the people with that knowledge and expertise, regardless of that, how people were primed to think did change their understanding and their, their response to the question. So that's our first example of how our words matter and our frames matter, because it really does shape how issues are seen and understood. Next, this is an example from our own research, um, and it's an example of how framing can change support for policies and programmes. So this graph comes from the work that we did with Impact on Urban Health. It shows the results of one of our large-scale experimental surveys where we were testing different ways of framing the issue of childhood obesity. So we had our control group who were asked a series of questions about their support for different policy changes uh, that, would, um, that would reduce obesity. And also, to what extent did they believe that this is actually an issue that society should be acting on collectively? They're represented by that zero thick black line along the horizontal axis. Now, another group who read a statement using childhood obesity as the central frame before being asked the same questions, and another group still read a statement using improving children's health as that central frame before being asked the same questions. And as you can see in the results here, support for policy change and that belief that this is something we should be acting on as a society was significantly strengthened when people first saw that information that was framed in terms of improving children's health, when they were primed with that idea. Meanwhile, the obesity framing, we might as well have said nothing at all. Those red bars, they're not statistically significant. And as you can see, if anything, one of them's slightly depressed. So essentially what we're seeing here is the difference that the right frame can make. Sometimes we don't realize that the way we're framing an issue is actually, it might not really be doing much. It might even be working against us. So that's why we have to test it. And then we find out the best ways. I'm going to now show you some footage from our, the same project that work on framing children's health. And your challenge here is to really basically spot the difference. Um, you'll see two clips with the same man. In between them, he was read a short, well-framed paragraph that used some of the framing principles that we found to be most effective in shifting thinking on children's health and food. And I want you to just look out for the difference between those two clips, and I'll, I'll summarize. So what do you think causes childhood obesity? I put a, or predominantly most of the blame on the parents because um, they're the ones making the meals for the, for the kids. And um, I think it's a big responsibility for parents to actually um, take that, that sort of responsibility on and make sure that the, their kids are getting what they need, not necessarily what they want because of course the kid is gonna want chocolates, chips, and all things nice. I think parents need a bit better education when it comes to actually having a good diet because if the parent and the adult doesn't have a good diet themselves or they're not attuned to it, it's just gonna trickle down into the kids. Um, so I think the first thing would be educating the um, adults So thinking about that paragraph, what does that sort of prompt you to think about? I think that uh, the food advertisement is definitely targeting um, young kids. Like you think about like, like cereals and all sorts of little baked goods. <laughs> the advertisements are really fun and, and, and colorful. And the, the, I feel like that is to target the younger demographic because they're going to be more uh, sort of like attracted to that kind of advertisement. I think potentially holding the uh, companies accountable for what they're doing and sort of switch the scales back to like a, a more healthy sort of food. Because I, I think it's all um, money, it's money grubbing really. It's just trying to get more profits. I think probably the, the government are the only ones with that kind of... Um, uh, ability or, or standing. So hopefully you could see there quite a significant difference. Um, essentially going from that sort of default way of thinking of thinking this is up to parents, essentially blaming parents for childhood obesity, to, and, and thinking therefore that changing behaviour is the solution, to 
thinking much more broadly, thinking about systems, thinking about the role of advertisers, food producers, and the government. Now, this shift from the individual to, to their context is exactly the change in understanding we wanted to be able to make on this project. And this is an example of how, you know, by shaping how people see and understand the issue, we can build support for much more holistic programmes and policies, rather than people necessarily defaulting to that first thought of being like, well, this must be down to individuals. Now, the other thing I wanted to just draw attention to in that clip is how in the after portion, he says, I think, I think, I think, multiple times, even though he'd said something really different just moments before. Now, this is an example of how, you know, all of us, first of all, can hold very contradictory ideas in our heads, and it's about what do we want to bring forward, but also of actually how he did have this more holistic understanding anyway. We just hadn't prompted it in the first instance, and basically, when we frame intentionally, we can just make sure we're starting in that place where we're having the conversation we wanted to have in the first place. What I'm basically trying to say here is that framing creates change, not just in one-to-one -one conversations, not just in a testing environment, but in our world. And there are countless examples that I could draw on here. There's a few on screen of campaigns you may well recognise. All of these campaigns made framing choices to tell their stories, to align and to amplify, to navigate the mindsets that people hold on their, their issue, and to invite people to think differently. Now, to pull out one example, the bottom right here, um, this is going back a few years ago to when campaigners in the UK were securing a ban on smoking in indoor public places. Now, this campaign could have followed very similar narratives to what a lot of anti-smoking initiatives had done previously, focusing on the idea of, you know, smoking as an individual vice. But they actually chose instead to focus on the idea of the right to a safe working environment, drawing attention to how secondhand smoke was really impacting the health of people just going about their jobs. They made it a collective issue. Now, that's one example, one campaign. There are so many others which have used framing to really flip how people think to open up more helpful ways of thinking in order to create change. But it all starts by understanding how do people actually think about the issue to begin with. And how we communicate about health, about food, poverty, all of this matters because it has the power to fundamentally change how people understand the problems we're up against and the solutions that are both necessary and possible. We need to start by understanding how people think, though. Now, our research at Frameworks always starts by seeking to understand what are the mindsets that people hold and share on a given issue. So this is, I alluded to this earlier when I said we want to know not just what people think, but why they think it, because attitudes may have more of a tendency to come and go with the news cycle, but how we think, how we reason about things is fairly, um, takes a very long time to change. Now, mindsets are basically patterns of thinking that shape how we understand the world. They are implicit, they are shared across the culture, and they are enduring. They're essentially the ways of thinking that enable us to think fast. Um, again, Elena mentioned earlier, we love being able to just like quickly make decisions because we are constantly bombarded by information day to day. Mindsets are basically one of the ways we've evolved to do that. And these are activated by the things that we see and hear every day from stories in the paper, conversations we have, podcasts we listen to. Constantly they are sort of activating different mindsets that are meaning we can think quickly. Now framing works when we're able to basically understand and then navigate those mindsets, those mental shortcuts, so that we can strengthen the ones that are going to be most helpful in activating positive social change and actually avoid those ones that are going to be unproductive, that are going to get us stuck in the same old conversation that's not necessarily been getting us anywhere. Now, I've drawn through a few obstacles to overcome some of those mindsets that have come up uh, in our research, looking at sort of food, poverty, health more broadly. Some of those mindsets it's good for us to be aware of so that we can build on more helpful ones and avoid triggering some of the less helpful. Now, first of all, top left, this idea of individualism is a mindset that shows up in different ways on a whole host of issues. Um, it's essentially the idea of how we do in life is kind of up to ourselves. Um, it's the idea when it comes to health that our health is made by our diet and our choices. And it's also the tendency to think that perhaps blaming people for poverty instead of seeing all of those things in our surroundings that can lead us to, to doing better or less well in life. 
top right, this is one of the ideas that we saw coming through in our research on poverty, a sort of assumption that we are, we are post-poverty, that there's no such thing as real poverty um, or hungry, our hunger in our country today. People saying things like, well, it's not as bad as Africa, for example, uh, and not seeing actually the, the reality that's right around us in our own communities. The next, uh, this idea of, of basic needs. Now, I've put this in here because it's a mindset to be aware of, which we could build, in, build on in more helpful ways, but we need to be, make, make sure we're not sort of triggering some of the directions this could take us in. So on the one hand, there's this sort of understanding that you know, certain basic needs should be met and should be supported by government. But that sort of definition of basic can sometimes get in the way a little bit and can lead to thinking like, well, any food is good food, instead of thinking about the quality of food being important as well. Fatalism, our, our nemesis when it comes to social change, this is a big mindset, again, we see on a whole host of social issues. It's that feeling of, you know, recognising there's a problem, but feeling like it's just too big to solve. And so, you know, where do we even begin? Um, obviously, that's a problem when we're wanting people to feel that change is possible. Um, and we can also see this coming up where people are sort of reasoning, well, you know, this is a problem, but it's just an inevitable part of modern life. Um, so barriers to change there that we need to overcome. And lastly, just wanted to pick up on not so much a mindset, but kind of a, a result of some of these mindsets that, that, that we share is that you know, when we are so focused on you know, problems and our, our own sort of ability to pull us out of problems, that individualism mindset, people can tend to default to solutions that are leveled at the, the level of the individual, basically. So people might reason, well, what we need to do here is, is help people to learn to cook on a budget, rather than thinking this is actually a social justice issue that requires far bigger solutions to that. So what do we do about it? How can we shift hearts and minds? How can we build on some of the more helpful ways of thinking we've seen in our research um, and actually have the conversation that we need to have? I'm going to start, um, before I go to my first recommendation, by doing a quick experiment. Um, I'm going to basically, on the next slide, you'll see a very short animation with, with no sound. And I just want you to, those in the room, shout out what you see. Um, I'll repeat it for those on Zoom. Um, and this is not a trick question. Just tell me what you see. <laughs> it built there. I can go. Hey. Okay. Don't be shy because it's not a trick question. <laughs> what do you see? Fish. Fish race, colored fish. Yep. We're seeing fish. We're focused on the fish. Now, We've just repeated an experiment which is known in psychology as the Michigan fish test. Every time I say that, it makes me smile. I just think it's a funny name for an experiment. But that's what it's called. I assume it happened in Michigan. What I do know is that it was presented to American and Japanese participants in a study that was conducted by Richard Nisbet and Tahahiko Masuda. And basically, in their five-second viewing, what they found was that Americans paid more attention to the fish, the main characters in the scene, while the Japanese participants described the scene much more holistically. They talked about the coral, the water, there's the ocean with some fish in it. Now, we regularly repeat this experiment in our workshops, and I overwhelmingly find, when I'm doing these in the UK, that we fall into the same camp as the Americans in the study. They notice the fish, the number of fish, the colours, the fact that one is slightly ahead of the pack. And this is unsurprising, as our culture is much more similar to the US than Japan. But why on earth am I talking to you about fish? It's not because they are a type of food. It's because this highlights something very important, which is that we are not primed to see context first. And when we're talking about issues like health and poverty, our inability to see context can be a big problem. And it's one that we need to and that we can overcome by making certain choices in our communications. Which takes me to my first recommendation, which is that we need to show how what surrounds us shapes us. We need to do more in our communications to show how external factors shape our lives and our health, because we know that people tend to think of individuals as being responsible for their own health, for their own sort of how they do in life. 
and can tend to reason that people end up in poverty because of certain choices rather than first and foremost seeing context and pressures that could lead any of us to experience poverty. And as a result, we tend to see solutions tend to be along the lines of sort of education. Um, we need to add context um, to open up people's thinking, show how more systemic support and action is needed. Much like that fish experiment, we need to draw people's attention to the bigger picture. For example, that could be the fact that junk food is often available and cheap, while healthy food is often much more expensive and harder to get to. It could be talking about how the rising cost of living can limit families' options and their ability to buy enough healthy food. There's lots of other things in our surroundings, our environments, that we can talk about to make this point, and I'm going to just share some ways that you can do that effectively. First of all, the really quick switch that we can make in our communications. Basically, when we talk about options or opportunities, we're highlighting what's available to someone. It's a nod to the wider context. When we talk about choice, there's a risk that we could be triggering the idea of individual choice, essentially. The idea that it's down to people, all of us just needing to make better choices. Now, one of the more helpful mindsets that we found in our poverty research is that people do recognise that money gives us options and freedom. This is an idea that we want to reinforce and build on because it's getting people to think systemically and beyond individual choice. So you could talk about how when families are struggling with the cost of living, it limits their options. So we need solutions like free school meals and greater access to more uh, affordable healthy food to open up those opportunities to them. It's a quick switch, but one that is helpful and indicative of that shift from individual to context. What surrounds us shapes us. Another a way that we can explain and show how what surrounds us shapes us is by using the right metaphor. Now, you might be thinking, well, metaphors, not a thought about them since school. Why are we looking at metaphors? But we love uh, testing to try and find helpful metaphors in our research at Frameworks because we all think in metaphors all the time. They're really sticky, they give a strong mental picture, and they can be very helpful in explaining how or why something happens, taking something much more uh, complicated and making it far more simple and concrete in people's minds. But we don't necessarily know what work a metaphor is doing unless we test it, which is why we test metaphors before we recommend them. And I wanted to share two with you today, one from our work on poverty, one from our work on children's health and food. So... Firstly, uh, this metaphor of restricts and restrains, a way of explaining the sort of experience um, of, of poverty, how it limits, uh, restricts our options and opportunities and can lock people in. Now, this is building on another of one of the more helpful mindsets we found in relation to poverty, which was the recognition that when people are experiencing poverty and have fewer resources and opportunities, once you're in there, it's much harder to escape. And so you need external help to alleviate those pressures, to sort of open up opportunities, to unlock you from those constraints. This idea is less front of mind than that idea of individual choice, so prompting this, this more systemic thinking uh, with this metaphor of restricts and restraints is helpful. Uh, we can use it in lots of different ways. You don't have to be uh, sort of stuck with just those words. Uh, you can also use this to talk about solutions that can unlock constraints, for example. Now, our, our poverty work in the UK is something which is one of our more long-running projects. We first did the research back in 2018, so um, a whole alliance of anti-poverty groups have been able to sort of mobilise and use our recommendations. And this is a snapshot of how we've seen this metaphor picked up in the media. It is, has been used pretty consistently in the media in recent years, and these are just a snapshot, and we see this being used across the political spectrum as well over time without necessarily us prompting or seeding this each time. So an example here of how the right metaphor can get picked up, and when it's picked up, it's then building more helpful understanding. Now, these are just a few examples of how you might apply this to this issue. We might talk about how targeted support could help to release people from the constraints of poverty, how free school meals could unlock opportunities for children to learn and thrive, how making healthy food more accessible and affordable would help to loosen poverty's grip. There's all sorts of different ways you could use this. The next metaphor I wanted to share this time comes from our work on children's health and food, and it's helpful for explaining how the wider food environment shapes our health. Now, 
In this case, we can basically compare the food environment to an unbalanced system of rivers, describing how our neighbourhoods are often flooded with unhealthy food while there's barely a trickle of affordable, healthy options available. And when we tested this metaphor, we found it was helpful in increasing understanding and building support for more systemic solutions that would then fix that food system. When we're communicating about food poverty, we need to build the picture that this is not only about quantity, it's also about quality. It's about whether people have access to enough nutritious food, not just any food. So that's why I wanted to share this metaphor today as a potential tool to help you to do that. Again, it can be used in all sorts of different ways. We can talk about stemming the flow of unhealthy food, working upstream to improve affordable, healthy options, talk about children being up against a flood of unhealthy food. Now, my, my one sort of watch out on this one is just not to take it too far. I don't want to talk about tsunamis. No disaster movie imagery here, no drowning, because remember, we're also up against that mindset of fatalism. And while you can you know, redirect a river, you can put in a dam, I don't think any of us could fight a tsunami. So we need to keep our, you know, our problem statement at the same level as our solution statement. Our next recommendation, and it relates to the first, but this is really about harnessing explanation. This is something we always think we're doing all the time in our communications, but there are some common traps we all fall into, and I definitely know that I have done, where we are basically not really explaining. We're just stating something. And so I wanted to share just a couple of ways we can really make sure we are explaining and we're building understanding. It's really important to get explanation right. This might sound basic, but basically when people understand our point, they're far more likely to agree with us. And when we fill in the gaps in people's understanding, they're much less likely to default to some of those maybe dominant, unhelpful mindsets that we, we've seen on some of these issues in order to make sense of things. So an example here, I really think of this as in, when you're explaining, you want to show, not just tell. Uh, you want to explain rather than claim. This example on the left saying too many people across the island of Ireland are experiencing food poverty. We must take action to protect everyone's right to food. It will only really work if someone already agrees with us um, because we're basically asserting this to be true without explaining it, giving further context. When we explain, we start to bring people with us. They can essentially follow our reasoning. It's like showing our workings. Um, and by doing that, we can increase understanding and also em empower people to make their own minds up. So they'll be less defensive if we're perhaps presenting quite a challenging view of the world. They're less likely to default to those unhelpful mindsets as well. So in this case, while I do not disagree with the left-hand statement at all, it would be more helpful to spell it out a bit more, saying something like, Rising costs are putting pressure on more and more people on the island of Ireland. They're making it much harder to put healthy food on the table. And access to nutritious food is an essential building block for our health. So we need to put this right. So here we've started to explain what causes food poverty. We've spelled out what we mean by it. Um, we've explained why this is important. Um, while instead of just using rights as a shorthand, we've really built on that idea of why this is a right. Um, so a couple of other things just to unpack. Note how I've, I've said putting pressure on, that's a nod to that restricts and restrains metaphor. Here using it to talk about some of those factors causing food poverty. I've referred as well to nutritious food as a building block for health, as this is a metaphor that came out of our wider determinants of health research as being just a really helpful way of increasing understanding of all those essential things that build health, that everyone in our society needs to be healthy. Three things to keep in mind to really harness explanation. Um, if you have space, really breaking things down step by step to show cause and effect is great. If we don't have space, even just giving it an example to illustrate your point is more helpful than just telling. It's starting to show as well. And thirdly, um, always good to check yourself and make sure you're spelling out and explaining any technical terms, even terms that you might not think are that technical because you use them all the time. Um, even things like food poverty and food insecurity, good to explain what they are and how they come about wherever we can. And again, just on shorthands like Right for Food, the Right for Food campaign is, is fantastic, um, but best harnessed when really we're explaining why, why we all need that right to food. Um, we've seen in, in some uh, of our research that a 
appealing to rights-based language without doing that step of really spelling out why something is a right, it can sometimes backfire. It can sometimes lead to sort of zero-sum thinking of like, oh, why are those rights important? What about me? Um, so it's just a, a bit of a watch out um, just to make sure we're spelling out that story and really telling that story of, of compassion and justice um, as well as mentioning the right to food. My third recommendation is that if you are using data uh, in your communications, think of it as something that will support your story rather than expecting it to tell the whole story for you. Um, data, numbers, statistics can be really helpful for backing up our point, but we just can't make the mistake of expecting them to speak for themselves because numerous studies unfortunately show that they don't or that they can be interpreted in very different ways. So we just need to use data carefully um, and consider how we frame it. If we don't, this, some version of this is likely to happen. Um, people will basically interpret numbers in different ways. They will often not draw the conclusion you hoped for. Essentially, what a lot of studies have shown is that if someone doesn't already agree with us, facts and statistics sometimes sort of bounce off. Um, people will interpret data using the most dominant mindsets they already hold. They'll make up their own stories <coughs> that, then, that then fit. They might not always be the stories we wanted to tell. Um, and we're all susceptible to this. In fact, the more educated we are, the more likely we are to do it as well. So sometimes when I'm doing uh, workshops, people will say, oh, but I'm working with experts and they want to see the data. And I'm like, oh, you better frame it though, because <laughs> if they don't already agree with you, they will be, their brains will be doing all sorts of mental gymnastics to interpret it the way that, that they want to, or that fits their existing beliefs. So long story short, data alone doesn't shift people's hearts and minds, but that's not to say that it can't be helpful to us all the same. Ooh, that slide has gone a bit strange. I'm gonna explain it anyway. <laughs> what I should have had here was, um, and I don't know why I've done this, um, a graph showing some of our research with Joseph Roundy Foundation on how to talk about poverty. And essentially what we did is we tested arguments that were based on the number of people in poverty uh, versus using that same data plus the added sort of value of compassion. And there was a control group as well who we were comparing these results to. So what we saw is that uh, arguments just using the data alone essentially didn't really move people. Um, but using that same data as part of a story um, that was more about how we all need to, this is a matter of compassion and justice, we saw huge increases in across the board, people's likelihood to support policies, to see that this was uh, a case that we should be acting on. I'm sorry that my, my graph isn't there, but I've told the story, which is the most important bit when you're working with data. So. <laughs> So to sum up framing data, really think about leading with a story you want to tell. Essentially, spell out what the data is telling us rather than leaving it to speak for itself. And use framing to cue those mindsets where you want to be meeting people. Put data in context. Think about what reference points people would need in order to see what the numbers really mean. Uh, so, for example, if you're talking about the sort of the number of people affected by something, are you telling a story about how that's increased? Do you need to share another figure to show that in context, for example? And wherever you can make numbers relatable, especially very large numbers, which are just very hard for us to compute, uh, consider using something like social maths. You know, you can compare, this is when people compare a certain area to the number of football pitches or saying a certain number of children in a classroom. Um, instead of a certain percentage of children in the population. Even things like, you know, one in five is easier to understand than 20%. And above all, a good sort of like check is if you were to take the numbers out of your communication, would it still tell your story? And if it doesn't, add some more context. We need to show we can fix it. In the last few weeks, all of the following things have been described uh, in the um, British and Irish press using exactly the same word. Housing, migration, sewage, rack concrete, Gen Z's loneliness, climate, Scottish ferries, and Airbnb. And that word is crisis. And the impact of this, when everything is a crisis, when we're told about these crises over and over again, a few things, if everything is a crisis, nothing really is we kind of have that sense of crisis inflation. It can spark disbelief, 
it can definitely spark abject fatalism, which we've already covered why that's a problem when we're wanting to change things. Research on a wide range of issues shows us again and again that a pure crisis message doesn't deliver the effects we would like it to. And our research tells us we need to make choices in our communications to counteract that sense of fatalism, which is constantly fed by stories like this every day. So what can we do about it? This isn't to say that we shouldn't be talking about the urgency of problems, that we shouldn't be talking about the scale of problems. But what we do need to do is overcome fatalism by also talking about our ability to fix problems, talking about the responsible parties who can step up and fix problems. It means showing that things can change intentionally and deliberately and that we have confidence that these changes can happen. So basically, don't leave people at the crisis. Share concrete solutions. Share upstream solutions. Be explicit change as possible. And where you can, balance that sense of urgency with efficacy, that sense of can do. Um, we would say that because we're so primed to think in fatalistic ways, you kind of need to over-egg the efficacy. So almost like for every dose of, of sort of crisis and urgency in our communications, two doses of can do, which can be both in tone and content. And what a difference when we do this. It gives us a sense of movement. It gives us a sense of, I want to be part of that, or you know, I need to get ahead of this change. Um, again and again, we've seen that it's when we start to talk about solutions and that change is possible that the change starts to happen. Now, my last recommendation I wanted to share was picking up on uh, one of the, the recommendations that came out of Elena's report. That sort of picking up on where do people with lived experience of the issue come into this? And sharing stories from people with lived experience, people most affected by an issue, can be an extremely powerful way of building understanding and connection. There are just a few things that we can bear in mind to make sure we're doing people's stories justice, essentially. First of all, telling diverse stories is really important um, because it stops problems from being dismissed as exceptional. They can't just be written off as being a really bad case of something when we're actually putting that in that context of, you know, this is affecting many people from all, all walks of life. It can also be helpful for showing scale uh, by connecting stories to each other and it can avoid hero or savior stories as well. And when telling stories from lived experience, we can ask and answer questions that help to draw out this kind of scale and context so that people's stories and the inequities that lie behind them can't just be explained away or written off. We need to be mindful of this because individualism can tend to dominate stories told from first-hand experience, and it can make it harder for people to see the role of systems in people's lives. All those external factors which can push people into poverty, which can make it harder for them to access the nutritious food they need. And it can get in the way of us thinking about this as a collective responsibility and the need for collective upstream solutions. So basically, we, we can overcome this and, and build on more helpful understanding. We just need to make sure we're adding scale and context if we're working with people to tell their stories. We can ask people things like, what support have you had? What support should you have had? What options or opportunities have you had or do you have now? Does this affect a lot of other people in your situation? Maybe drawing on shared experiences, like does this affect other people you know of long-term health conditions? All these questions like this are pulling this away from it's an individual, but we're getting a wider story, um, which is taking into account that sort of context, the places where the solutions need to happen, um, and really empowering people to, to bring that to life if we choose to, to do so. So that's been my sort of five tips. I could have said more. I had to really limit myself to five. Um, but I really hope this is helpful for you as you sort of take this forward and think about how you can all uh, have that shared story about, about food poverty. And the reason this is so important to have that kind of shared communications approach is that so often when we're hearing about an issue, it can kind of look and feel a bit like this. So lots of different well-meaning voices and organisations saying different things in different ways. If you're someone listening from the outside, somebody with a busy life, with kids to pick up and a dog to walk and, and everything else, it can be hard to actually hear a clear signal through, through all of this noise. But when we draw on the same frames as an organization, as a sector, as a movement, it starts to look and feel a lot more like this. So 
Something to bear in mind here is that frames are not sort of strict messages, they are ideas. They are ideas which you can use in a whole range of ways to best suit your organization, your tone, your, your particular things you're calling for. But they're a scaffolding that a whole field of practice can use to structure their communications, to write their messages, still tailoring them to audiences, dialing different elements up or down. But fundamentally, by using those same underpinning ideas, it's helpful. Uh, this isn't, isn't about everyone saying exactly the same thing in exactly the same way, but it's about using framing to support the same story and to essentially move people in the same direction to make sure that messages and the understanding that you're trying to create does take hold. If this has seemed helpful to you today, and I hope it has, we have loads of resources on our website um, from how to talk about the building blocks of health, the work we've done with HSE on children's health and food. We have an image bank we've created, which all have sort of non-stigmatizing images which take into account our wider food environments, free to use. Um, we have our framing toolkit with JRF on talking about poverty and, and much more, all at frameworksuk.org. So thank you very much and looking forward to the panel. <laughs>